you look good. always great. Unless I'm on trauma call or I know I have procedures. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
a convergence of many uh, forces that caused this great uncertainty uh, over the last many months, uh, perhaps a year or more. I believe that what has fundamentally happened with um, the decisions that were made by the legislature um, are to a great extent relieving that uncertainty. Not that you know exactly what's going to happen to each of you in terms of potential opportunities and new directions, but the uncertainty about whether the state even cares. And I think that is at a certain level what's actually most important here, which is the uncertainty we all labored under about whether the state actually had a vision for what it wanted to do with public medical education and how it wanted to solve what is a very profound healthcare crisis in the state. And, and I think that's fundamentally what happened here. It obviously has a huge impact on the actual structures within which we all work. But at a higher level, I think what, what has happened that's most profound is the state has made a clear commitment and many different legislative and political and other forces have come together to be very clear about uh, the state's commitment to, to the academic medical enterprise uh, in the state. The moment the governor signed um, that bill two weeks ago, uh, everything changes. So all of the uncertainty, all of the discussions, all the proposals, the ups and downs, the regents meetings, state of the school meeting addresses in the past, all of that to some extent is now uh, void. When the governor signs the appropriations bill, we're off in an entirely new direction, I think with a much more, more clear focus. UNLV and UNSAM have uh, extremely challenging but extremely different tasks. Um, and so we are each about to embark on extraordinarily difficult uh, initiatives, one to launch a school, one to uh, reconstruct a, a school with a very different um, direction. But the tasks are not quantitative tasks. It's not just, you know, build this teaching capacity, hire this faculty member, hire this staff member, create this practice plan, uh, do this curriculum, do this application. This is a a profound qualitative change in how the entire state's gonna deal with public medical education and a, and a change that the state has not seen um, before. To a great extent, UNSOM to this point was defined by simple geography. We got pulled into a system where we had part of a campus here, part of a campus here. If you uh, Google the question what is the halfway point between Reno and Las Vegas, which is kind of how the school was defined to some extent, being a foot in each camp and to some extent uh, having to ignore rural communities. If you ask that specific question, you actually get an answer. Uh, the answer is a town called Millers. Anybody know where Millers is? It's near the Tonopah gold mining fields and it's a ghost town. You can make of that what you wish symbolically, uh, but that's how it felt to some extent and how it has felt for quite some time to, to not be anywhere exactly and to be defined mostly by geography. I think now, and my main point in my comments tonight, now we are defined by missions and defined by clear vision and defined by service to the state and defined by what academic institutions um, do. And I'm gonna come back to that several times. There is always the trite phrase about the Chinese character for change is the characters for um, crisis and opportunity. Uh, but the, the reality is that's true here, that there is going to be wrenching change and there are going to be major opportunities. And I think we have to for, figure out and sort out how that's going to uh, work itself out. But I, would, I will remind you over and over that it has to come back to our missions. What are we here for? not we, we, but the larger we, the entire uh, academic medical, medical enterprise in the state, and what are, what are we here to, um, to serve? So I wanna address three questions. What do these changes mean for UNSAM? What do these changes mean for all of you? And then I'm gonna talk a bit more personally at the end about what these changes mean for me. Uh, my intent is, as I've said before, my intent is uh, not to try to make you happy. Uh, that would be nice, and if I could do that, I, I would do that. But I don't think we're, we can do that. 
because I think only you will eventually decide how this is going to play out uh, for you. What I want to do is to validate what your concerns, validate what's happening, uh, provide some larger perspective for what's happening, uh, deal with the reality of, of what's happening, the inevitability of the change that's going to take place, uh, lay out strategies for how that change is going to be managed and keep coming back to our fundamental mission and, and vision. And what opportunities come from what I believe are extraordinary new directions in that, in that mission and vision. And specifically, we're going to talk about how to link uh, the missions and the directions of UNSAM and UNLV and how to link timelines and how to make this happen in a way that uh, is not only palatable, but actually could be, I think, extremely uh, positive. So let me start with the legislative uh, update, just so everybody has the, the, the same facts. Uh, the governor submitted a budget. Uh, the legislature added to that and had additional appropriations so that UNLV has received its full uh, request for the next biennium. Uh, there will uh, undoubtedly be requests uh, beyond that into the next legislative sessions, but for this next biennium, uh, UNSOM received its full request, uh, about 27 million, is that right? UNSOM has its corresponding request, 5.5 million. It starts out small in the first year, ramps up in the, in the second year. Uh, UNLV now has the go ahead and the funding to be able to uh, finish its uh, materials to the LCME. They're due August 1st. Uh, they're in a very tight time frame. Dr. Atkinson uh, will certainly comment on that uh, in a moment. UNSOM has to create the corresponding uh, teaching capacity in Reno to build out the full campus so that as we shift from Las Vegas and most of our teaching, not all, most of our teaching shifts for students uh, from uh, Las Vegas to Reno, that there's capacity to receive that. That process is going along extremely well. The UNSOM funding mostly is devoted to that process in Reno, mostly devoted to developing an office of community faculty, to faculty development for community physicians, to the recruitment, the care, the feeding, the support, the development of a cadre of community physicians to develop that clinical uh, teaching capacity to support clerkship expansion for all disciplines um, in Reno. There's additional staffing for the Office of Academic Affairs. UNSOM has its own LCME process coming up in which um, we're gonna get very intensely involved uh, in the fall uh, on into 16, a ramp up to a um, self-study during uh, 2016, a site visit in the fall of 2017. So there are actually fairly parallel processes taking place in terms of LCME and medical school accreditation. Uh, there's one-time funding for Project ECHO, which will help support our uh, uh, specialty consultation outreach to rural areas. There's some funding in there for loan repayment matching, which is good and new, something we've not had for quite some time, which might help in terms of um, uh, medical student recruitment. But there are additional pieces that I want to make sure you know about in all of the legislative appropriations. There is a, an additional $3 million uh, from a special slot tax um, that came through and she specific for the medical school to expend in Las Vegas. So we're going to invest heavily in surgical simulation equipment and surgical training equipment in the, in the Sim Center, uh, invest in the lead clinic development for pediatrics, uh, put a little bit of money into 1701 for some enhanced AV and IT support for education in the 1701 uh, building. And there's even other NSHE funding that's not related to the medical school but indirectly affects all of us, which is that furloughs were, were eliminated uh, there was a cost of living increase approved for uh, those people supported by uh, state funds. And there's GME money, which I won't talk about much, but there's a separate uh, governor's budget for startup money for new residency programs, and we certainly hope that we'll tap into that, uh, both north and, and south. So that's the details. But again, I go back to the fact that the fundamental issue is that the state came together around a vision for public medical education and made a clear commitment to two schools of medicine, two clear missions, two clear uh, approaches to serving uh, the state, and a clear commitment to a statewide view of public medical education. And I'm going to keep coming back to that because I think we have to keep coming back to that. So let's talk specifically about Las Vegas. Um, I had a corresponding session uh, Monday night in Reno, and we talked more about Reno, talked about 
relationships with Renown and a clinical platform at Renown and clinical integration for the practice plan. I want to talk more specifically about Las Vegas um, here. I understand that there is an inevitable grieving and an inevitable sense of loss in, in these decisions, that you feel like you have lost something. And I get that. Um, we had a vision for single school, two full campuses. Uh, and I think it was a good vision, um, but um, not uh, accepted by the political system as, as, as a whole. I think the current plan, the current vision, is equally wonderful. There are lots of ways to go about a statewide vision, but I get the fact that it may not be what you uh, wanted, but it is the, is the way it is. It just occurs to me that I want to make sure you um, take a look at the website here. We have a system in place in which you'll be able to submit questions online uh, if you wish to, but uh, microphones as well. So I get the fact that, uh, that this is not pleasing at, um, at a certain level and that uh, UNSAM is headed in a different direction. UNLV is uh, coming online. But I think the reality is we have to ask different questions. And, and I think the question fundamentally is what can, uns what can the Las Vegas campus be? What can all of you be that can be the best that you can be in academic medicine? It's not what you thought you might be under a former plan, but what is the core of, of what this campus is? What is the fundamental organizing structure that could relate to UNSAM, that could relate to uh, UNV, UNLV, and, and could commit to the core missions that, uh, that we had talked about? I think that, that UNSAM, to, the, to this point, has brought the academic um, values, in a sense. Uh, in, this, in the sense of being the, the focus for uh, an undergraduate medical education uh, mission, a GME uh, mission, research collaborations, uh, and acad academic infrastructure for what is a large practice plan, in a sense, and a large group practice that has taken on huge academic uh, responsibilities. Now those links in that academic infrastructure to some extent, is going to shift to UNLV in some fashion. We have to figure out how that's going to take place. UNSAM will continue to have students. We'll continue to have the GME partnership uh, at Mountain View. But we are not going to be the major focus for that academic infrastructure, that academic underpinnings. And we have to figure out how UNSAM and UNLV can partner and can come together so as to, in a sense, take care of you, support you, accommodate you in what you want to be as, as, an, as an academic um, program here. So I do believe in certain regards that the, that the practice plan is, the, is that central organizing force. It's certainly the most dominant set of activities. It encompasses a, a huge proportion of what happens here uh, as the clinical platform. And I would make the point that there's a corresponding discussion of of a different sort taking place in Reno. And, and I think it might help for you to understand my, my, my logic here. To me, uh, what medical schools and, and public medical education rest on is a clinical platform. The question is how to find that clinical platform on which you layer all the teaching responsibilities, on which you layer all the research collaborations. What is the, what is the organizing uh, force? Now you, it, we could be, UNLV and UNSAM could be completely, truly community-based, meaning we do only teaching and research. We have no clinical platform. We're totally dependent on the community world uh, for that. That, in general, is an extremely difficult and fraught approach. I think, in general, to the extent that we both can, can have hospital partners or practice plan partners or other bases upon which to build the academic programs, I think that's um, better. So I think we have to figure out how to use this central organizing force as the platform for faculty uh, appointments, for reimbursement, for funding for academic activities, potentially from, from both institutions, how that eventually shifts over time to become truly UNLV-based. Barbara and I have talked about joint appointments. We need to move on those immediately. I think we're prepared to um, um, develop joint appointments for every single uh, faculty member so as to get that on the books and make clear what the commitment is, not necessarily with funding right away, that happens over time, 
as the teaching responsibilities shift, but we need to make clear that uh, not, you're not losing one home, you're actually gaining one and have two, theoretically, for the, for the foreseeable future. There's a very clear mandate from NSHE and from the Board of Regents to uh, protect you, to nurture you, to support you, to develop uh, career development for faculty and staff members. And I think you need to hear that very clearly. And I think that the, the, the Regents, the Health Sciences Committee, and the Chair and the Vice Chair and the Chancellor would want you um, to know that. And there's a very clear expectation and accountability on the part of Barbara and me to report to them about how we are managing this in a way that is satisfying for you and enhances your career opportunities in academic medicine. I would also point out the 1701 building constitutes, in my mind, a new, very impressive academic base. There will be substantial new space, classroom space, IT and AV support, library opportunities, clinical research uh, support. Uh, it is a clear statement that, that the state as a whole, not necessarily UNSAM, not necessarily UNLV, but the state as a whole is committed to that base for academic medicine. Um, so, I think we need to strengthen the practice plan to the greatest extent possible, enhance it, build it, grow it, ha uh, have the plan have uh, more uh, sense of control over its destiny to be able to be a platform upon which uh, uh, eventually UNLV builds, builds its school. Let me divert very briefly before I finish up. Uh, I know there's been discussion about the restructuring of HR. Um, and somehow that that's related to all of this or that it's an example of something. And I just want to, I hope, um, clarify that and clear the air a bit. The HR restructuring has nothing to do with this. It has nothing to do with Reno. It has nothing to do with um, legislative funding. It's been in play for over a year. And in fact, I would say it's been in play since the first day I came when I wanted to make changes that would make HR uh, more responsive, a leaner, um, more responsive to the needs of the department chairs and the needs of the, of the department. It's a completely different approach to linking faculty recruitment to onboarding and faculty development and career development while we split off the pay administration, some of the technical aspects, move that to finance and budget, and uh, move even some other parts over to uh, basic functions at, at UNR. The point is to really have a very um, uh, privatized-like search firm approach that's very client-friendly and, and supports the department chairs and does what you've asked me to do. I would tell you that the most consistent complaint or concern that's expressed to me by department chairs and faculty members is the process we, that we developed over time for HR, and that's what I wanted to uh, fix. We're going to develop employee relations that I think will be helpful, senior recruitment managers that I think will be uh, helpful. I just want to make clear that this has nothing to do with the bigger issues that are going on. Okay, let me finish up. So, three questions. What does it mean for UNSAM, both Las Vegas and uh, Reno? I'll take you back again. Statewide vision, statewide accountability, uh, statewide monitoring. This ultimately is not about UNSAM. It's about the state as a whole taking on um, the responsibility for a, a rational, better supported, appropriate system of public medical education as opposed to everything that went on over the last uh, many years. Very clear supervision by Board of Regents and by the higher education system. The strategic planning that has been going on for a couple of years is now going to move into a very active implementation plan. <coughs> and it's critical for you to know that we're going to move quickly, we're going to move decisively, we'll communicate regularly. Uh, We've been waiting for a long time. The moment the legislature spoke, uh, it's the time to move. Barbara and I are going to work very closely together. There can be very tight timelines, very clear linkages of timelines and dates. I can't tell you all the details of that at the moment, but as recently as yesterday and as soon again as tomorrow, we are going to have at this hard in terms of some very clear tasks, some very clear timelines, some very clear uh, dates. Um, I think most immediately uh, UNLV is going to start to think about faculty recruitment, faculty positions, developing positions for, um, for the faculty, how that transition will take place. Um, I'll just mention as an aside for Reno that there's a, a corresponding issue taking place in terms of the clinical integration of, 
the uh, pediatrics and internal medicine departments in Reno with a hospital base. And so we're working very hard to move whole sections of the practice plan to the renowned uh, health system base. Different issue, equally intense as, as what's going on here. Um, second question, what does it mean for you? I do believe, however disruptive the change is, that there are extraordinary opportunities here. I think that there will be much more opportunity for you to achieve uh, your goals now that we have lifted this sort of oppressive uncertainty about whether the state even cares about the school, whether the state even cares about you. I know that change is difficult, that the uh, uh, known uh, stress is somehow better than the unknown stress, but, but I think that, that known risks were very great. Th this was not a sustainable, not a tenable approach that we'd been struggling with for all of these years. I think, it, I think we now have a, a way to go forward. I think you should understand that Barbara and I, others, we get the fact that you are the school's most precious resource. Facilities are nice, equipment's nice, all that's nice, but the school is you, and you are the resource that we have to manage in a, in a proper uh, way. I think this change is going to test you, and it's going to test your commitment to academic medicine. Um, I hear from time to time people say the, you know, the, the, the catchphrase, well, uh, maybe uh, I'll just leave, I'll just go into private practice. Um, I don't really believe you when you say things like that because I think you're more committed to the academic enterprise, you're more committed to an academic institution, an academic platform. If you truly believe that, then I would question whether you were committed in previously to that fundamental academic vision. Now that we actually have a way to go forward, I think that this is how times get good. And that leads to my final question is, what does it mean for me? So I've heard all kinds of rumors um, about how uh, I'm sort of done with what I came here to do and so I'm leaving or somebody asked me if I was going to be dean of both medical schools and I said, oh my God, uh, please. Um, or that uh, I've uh, been wanting to jettison Las Vegas uh, all, all this time or uh, other pretty wild and, and, and crazy things. What I would want you to know is I'm actually more energized than ever because of what I believe to be extraordinary opportunities to actually affect the entire state, to actually do what we all are here to do, which is to actually improve health and health care for the entire state and to have half a chance with state vision and state support to actually do it right. I actually think this is the starting line, at least for me personally. I've been here four years and we've never actually been properly constituted to do what it is that we all are here to do. So I actually think this is the beginning for me to, to um, help and contribute in some way uh, to a plan to actually affect health care for uh, the entire state. So I'll just finish by saying I just think this is bigger than all of us, uh, that we all have our piece in this and, and we're affected by all of it, but it's, what's going on is way bigger. Uh, than that. There's so many constituents depending on us, students, residents, patients, science itself in terms of research development, business, employers, all of our partners that, that we're developing. The entire state's health care rests to a considerable extent on all of us being part of, of what's happening here. Um, and so I think we have a chance to do what um, we've always wanted to do. I think we have a chance to do what the state wants us to do. I think now it actually gets exciting to um, serve the state as we have always uh, wanted to do. With that, I'll uh, invite Barbara to make some comments, and then we'll start to uh, look for questions on the computer screen here. Please. So thank you, everybody, for coming. I think this is a very impressive crowd. And I'm really glad to have a real first opportunity to talk to you and just tell you a little bit. And I hope I have time to answer some questions. I want to say that I just want to second everything Tom said. We really want to do what's best for the state. I want to do what's best for the state. And I want to do what's best for Las Vegas. And I do see you, the faculty, as the people who are key to, to what we have to do. I really want to be clear that 
we need to stabilize the faculty here and take good care of our students and residents during this transition time, however long the transition time takes, and I hope it doesn't take too long. Um, but I want to also be clear that I want all of the faculty to know that you have a position in UNLV School of Medicine if you want it. So we really want to include everybody. We want to see this place stabilized. We want to say maybe it's not going to be the same position exactly because it's a different medical school. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what's different about the medical school just so you would have an idea of what we're doing. Um, I don't know how m many of you, I've never given the talk I give to the whole community, um, to you all, and maybe sometime we can set up one where, where I really give the talk and you can hear what I say to everybody else in the whole city. Um, but uh, we really want to have a, a very exciting medical education curriculum, and I think we do. As you heard, we're getting ready to submit our accreditation um, package, our database, and our self-study for August 1st. We're trying to get it written by July 1st so we can send it to outside people to review. So that has the whole curriculum outlined. It has everything about the students, the student body we want to pick, how we want to pick it, student admissions, student financial aid. We would finished the bylaws. We finished the curriculum. But the time between... Um, September and the end of December, we have to do an hour by hour plan for our whole first two years. So we maybe even would like to tap some of you to help and some of the committees to help outline the very specific curriculum pieces. But we think it's an exciting curriculum. It's a very different one. Just say a couple minutes about it. We're starting out with the first six weeks of the class being um, certified EMTs. Um, so we really think we can do some public health during that time and do some cultural competency during that time. And we think students will like to start out getting some clinical in input right from the beginning. It's a problem-based curriculum that's organized by systems. We have um, medical Spanish for everybody. We have virtual anatomy, not regular gross dissection of anatomy, um, taught mostly by surgeons and radiologists. We have uh, uh, body experience because we have an uh, affiliation with the coroner's office, and so they're going to get to see autopsies right there during that part of it. Our basic science part is going to go a year and a half, and then at the midpoint, uh, after they've taken step one, we're going to go right into an entire clerkship year that's not an inpatient clerkship year, it's an outpatient clerkship year. So we're going to set up a practice that's all the basic things that a clerkship would have. It's going to be longitudinal, meaning not broken up by weeks of this and then that and then the other, but everything all together, Monday, OBGYN, Tuesday, internal medicine, and so on. So we think that'll be really exciting. We'll set up practices that are aimed at the Medicaid population, and we think that'll be really good. We're really embedding hospitality services in, in the way we treat patients and the way we're going to set up our practices. And then the fourth year, they'll do two sub-internships and an ICU rotation. So the hospital part will come all as a bunch in the fourth year. We really see a, it as an exciting curriculum. You've probably heard that we got scholarships for the whole first class. We got 25 scholarships for this, and this is for the whole four years. We have 25 scholarships for the second class, the third class, and the fourth class, almost half of each of those classes as well. So I think we'll get some really good students. We're looking for a very diverse population of students from, from this location to the extent that we can, people that we think we can keep in Nevada. So that's who we're going to see as top students. And we really see a different culture in our school. So that's something that we'll do a lot of faculty development to talk about, to think about, and to to help, but it really, I think, will be something exciting, and I hope I can keep you excited enough to stay here, stay on the faculty, keep uh, this school going uh, as we transition. The way we got our budget was we got $7 million for this year that starts July 1, and then $20 million for the next year. This year, we're adding mostly structural people, the, the actual financial aid, the actual student admissions, those kinds of programs. It's really the second year, it's the start of 2016, that we really have the money to recruit the faculty and clinicians. And that's the time that I'd see many of you starting to move over. Um, the year after that, we hope we'll have even more money uh, by that time. We have um, a lot of 
philanthropy to, to actually get before we really can move as quickly as I want to move on, on additional residency programs and on additional buildings and on additional clinical programs. I really think Las Vegas needs some of the clinical programs that have been missing. Liver transplant for one, bone marrow transplant for another one, heart failure program for another one. So there's a lot of things to do, but I have to ask for philanthropy for that. The money I ask the state for is purely the educational piece that would pay you all to teach medical students and residents. So that's what I have money for at this point. Uh, we're looking for a building uh, uh, across from Valley Hospital on the old health district site, 10 acres. We're looking to build a big health science library there and ultimately move the other health schools of UNLV, the nursing, the health professions, the community and public health school as well. So we think it'll be exciting here in this medical district. Um, we wanna put one practice in this kind of an area here, but we want one of our practice sites to be in North Las Vegas, one to be in Henderson. And we see a very strong partnership with UMC very strong partnership with the VA, and Sunrise and Dignity System also want to partner with us. So I think there's going to be lots of opportunities for things. So I hope you can all get excited about it. I hope you can all hang in as we get this planned, and, and maybe I can ask some of you to help us out in the planning as we move along. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. So um, prepared to receive questions on the computer. Um, looks like there are a couple. Microphone is here. Uh, oh, no, that wasn't a question. Still connecting to the wireless. Technology. <laughs> Please. Are you leaving Sandy or coming to the microphone? I'm coming to the <laughs> microphone. Is that okay? That, that's okay. absolutely okay. <laughs> Um, so I think it's very exciting that Nevada now has this opportunity to really build medical education. I'm really thrilled about this. And I appreciate your remarks from both of you because I think it does help alleviate a lot of anxiety for many of us down here in Las Vegas. I guess the one thing that I'm still a little unclear on, um, I do run the biggest residency program in the state. I run the internal medicine program here. And recruitment season, I think about what am I going to say to the people I'm trying to recruit into my program this fall? You talk about strong ties with UMC, so what do I tell them in terms of where their future is, because it's three years of training that they would start next year. Which medical school are they a part of? Uh, yeah, that is the most immediate question. I think that we have to have a, a very concrete transition plan for residency sponsorship with specific dates and a specific uh, uh, set, of, set of activities. Uh, uh, shifting sponsorship or accreditation will be enormously complicated and needs to be done extremely carefully and extremely precisely. Lots of communication with uh, ACGME, but even more with all the individual RRCs. The message I would give is uh, you may start with one school, end up with another school, it'll be seamless. There will be no gaps, there will be no disconnect, the programs will continue, they'll grow, they'll thrive, they'll be supported. The state is committed. That's why I keep talking about what I said, which this is not about either of us in certain regards, it's about the state as a whole. We are accountable to demonstrating how we're gonna do this so precisely and so carefully uh, that you shouldn't have to even think about it in that, in that sense. And I can't tell you exactly but there's going to be a lot of work on exactly that question, which is exactly what has to happen, by whom, when, and, and when a, a date certain occurs that, that sponsorship would, would shift. Can I? Please. And, and maybe I just, I want to echo just that. I think we're going to try to work out these timelines this summer. So by fall and before you start the recruiting season, you should know that this is the date that it'll switch over. We're going to begin to get an institutional accreditation right away. We're going to begin a search for the DIO this fall and hope that we can be ready whenever programs are ready to transfer. But it'll be whatever date we and the steering committee decide it's going to be, but you'll know. But it'll still be a residency that's for internal medicine at UMC and the VA, for pediatrics, Sunrise and UMC, that part's not going to change. Thank you. 
that's very helpful. Okay. Beverly, please, just because people are at home. Ryan, is that picking up okay for people at home? Okay. I'm just wondering about medical students, I mean, uh, college students, because there are a lot of questions out there about, you know, uh, UNLV opening 2017. I'm getting a lot of questions about that, and I'm not quite sure. I think that's your question. Yeah, that's my question, and that's a very important one, and I probably should have said. Um, we hope to be able to start in 2017. If you back it all up, the accrediting agency looks at our documents we put in August 1st, this October, and they decide if they'll do a site visit. And they would come for a site visit, we hope they'll decide they will, in January or February, that's the beginning of 16. And then their June meeting, they would decide that we could accept students, and that's what we hope. So, but we cannot even talk to students until June uh, or July, whenever the actual word comes down that we can accept students. There is a terrible stiff penalty if we do. It actually says that we would have to graduate one entire class on an accredited school. Um, and so we are not, as you can imagine, talking to people. We're getting calls every day, multiple calls, because of the scholarships. And we refer them to the, an AMA website, and we refer them to watch our own website. And we hope it'll be by July next year that we'll be able to, to actually be able to talk to students. So you can tell them to, to hang on and to, to wait for July. Thank you. So we do have a couple of questions. The other computer sort of lost its, its uh, wireless. Let me take at least one. How can, two, how can the two schools recruit a good number of quality students? Will Reno reduce its class size given the finite number of good candidates? Uh, this is a topic of incredible importance, and Barbara and I have a lot of work to do here. Um, let me take the question apart. Um, I think we both have to expand our horizons in terms of types of students, both in-state and out-of-state, children of alumni, students who have Nevada connections but may not actually be residents, contiguous states, contiguous counties in California. Um, yes, we, me, and I'm quite sure Barbara would say the same thing, we have to recruit to quality. If that means that UNSOM reduces its class size for a bit while um, uh, Las Vegas starts up, uh, we will absolutely uh, do that. I have no preconceived numbers. Uh, if we go back to where we were a few years ago, 60, that would be fine. If we go below that, that's fine. We go to quality and then we build back up. The other answer to the question is a huge pipeline issue. Um, Nevada puts a very small number of students in total into medical education. Not necessarily either of our schools, but anywhere. Way low compared to uh, other Western states or other, other states around the country. Embarrassingly low, and it's a reflection to some extent of um, the lack of pipeline programs and the need to dig into those, but we've had some good pipeline programs for quite some time that have been extremely successful, but not as well supported as they could be. Those need to expand dramatically. UNLV has to have its own set, I think, in, in Las Vegas, but obviously that takes time. If you're gonna start back at middle school or high school, it's going to be a while for those students to get here, so we're going to have to um, adjust. I, I, I can't agree more. The pipeline through K through 12 is extraordinarily important, and we really have to work on that. That's really where they decide if they're going to go to medical school. Then there's also an issue that, in the end, I'm not sure if you're going to be re redefining the students you want, but we've looked at the students we want and really want a very diverse population of students that mirrors this city. And so it's not necessarily the highest test scores or the highest grades. We have spent a lot of time in our student committee talking about this, the special features that we want our students to have and how we're going to pick those students. So it, it may not be that we're even looking at the same one. Ones. What we do both want to do is keep every good student in Nevada in Nevada and not going to some other school across the country. So, so we want to keep the good students here and then build the pool. Uh, I guess a minor point to add to that. For UNSOM, I think uh, we have done a good job but could do even more in rural outreach and we could uh, explore pipeline programs there as well. And I do think that the north-south issues for many, many years ha has, detract has caused us to not pay as much attention to rural needs, rural communities, rural students as, as we might. We, we've had 
great staff working very hard under very difficult conditions. I think we can support those programs uh, better. Another question concerns building clinical and basic science research at both schools, and maybe each of us should respond to that. For, for UNSAM in Reno, obviously the basic science platform is extremely strong. It's relatively small, but extremely well funded. Uh, one of my highest priorities is to layer uh, some very uh, intense clinical and translational research infrastructure uh, over that. And I think there will be donor support to uh, do that as we really settle, settle in. And I assume UNLV has similar plans. Exactly. We don't have any basic science research space at this point. We have to, again, ask donors to help us support that. So we'll start with more population-based things. But I've been pretty clear that there are about five programs that I really want to try to build research in. One of them is mental health and addiction, probably the biggest problem in Las Vegas. And we want to do that with the VA. It's also their biggest problem, and they have funding, and they have research space. So we really will try to recruit to that program and build that. Cardiology, I see, is a huge opportunity. Neuroscience, working with the Ruvo Brain Institute, is a huge opportunity to build science on top of that. Cancer, I'd love to see an NCAI designated cancer center. I'm a cytopathologist, so that is very close to my heart. Um, and, and I think it's doable here over 10 to 15 years, not over a very short term, past my lifetime. So, uh, and orthopedics, that's the other one that I want to see a research program in. So I think there are real opportunities here. It'll take time to build those. Those are not my top priority right this minute. Medical education and graduate medical education right this minute are top priorities. Other questions? come all the way over, sorry. I know, we should have one on that side too, I apologize. So Lisa Palmer, Chair of Family Medicine, I actually have two questions. Uh, our, our department, like many other programs, are truly statewide. So any thoughts, I mean, I would not like to see a division between North and South. Uh, I had spoken to the Board of Regents when this first started and to you, Dean Schwenk, about really trying to look and not destroy programs that were throughout the state because I would see that we are all part of the Nevada system of higher education, whether we're UNLV or UNR. We're here for the, to support the state of Nevada. And then my... Totally uh, agree, and I, I hope that's what you heard me say several times, uh, that I think if we do this right, we have a model statewide program for how two universities, two medical schools, a very far-flung state geographically and, and population-wise, can actually do this well. And so I, as we talked about, uh, for example, your, your rural residency program, there ought to be ways for you to uh, expand that program with a connection between Las Vegas and Winnemucca, but have uh, people or resources or consultations or other uh, uh, programs in, in Reno s supplement that in, in certain ways. There should, there should be some fairly easy ways to have that type of integration, especially when it's a single system of higher education and a single Board of Regents, which is not true in, in all states. So I think that this can be done. So do I. Um, the second question, I'm going to speak on behalf of the, the practice plan staff. Um, it's, it's a little easier to see the way for faculty uh, through this whole process, but uh, the reason that we are able to function within our departments, the reason we're able to function in our clinics and teach the residents, it, our staff is very important uh, for all of this, and I'm not sure that um, either of you have really spoken to your vision of seeing what's sort of going to transpire with uh, staff that are sort of non-state staff. Right. Yeah, I apologize for not really addressing that specific issue. I, I think we can do much better with the practice plan operations, uh, with salary schedules, with benefits. Uh, I think that that's that um, that the that the operations of the practice plan, both north and south, perhaps even more in the north, somewhat in the south, that that the operations have suffered because of the considerable turmoil and fuss over many, many years. I think now that it's more clear uh, who is doing what 
for whom and what the relationships are and what the sponsorships are and what the support is, I'd like to think that we could do better in that regard. I think that speaks to some extent to um, more local control, more control of your destiny, more control of your operations, more control of how you manage your uh, clinical affairs. I believe that if we can just sort of dispense with much of the, of the history and, and the, the back and forth uh, in, in financial affairs and management affairs and overhead and a, and a lot of those issues, I think we can do better at that when it's really yours and it's local and your partnerships are clear and your sponsorships are clear. Uh, I think the staff will benefit. Yeah. So I may have a different philosophy about practice plans. Um, I love them. I think the clinicians need to be putting clinical revenue in so they can incentivize their own salaries. I think there needs to be a big chunk that comes from the school for teaching purposes and then an earned clinical part and, and incentives set up to earn more but to also teach and earn at the same time. So I see us setting up a, a separate practice plan with a, perhaps a different incentive um, plan, uh, program to it. We've just we haven't actually even completed the RFP. We've completed it, we've picked a consultant, and one of the issues they're looking at, one of them is GME, which we already talked about. One of them is the practice plan and what, how it would be set up and how it would work. I don't see taking this practice plan that's current here into us, and, and that's not anything against it as much as it is against, I would never take the liability of other people into a brand new school, it's just, I've been there and done that, and you don't. You can get burned by things like that. That doesn't mean we wouldn't move people, and we for sure will move all the faculty into the practice plan. So that that engagement with the, this consultant is due to be over about October. So we should probably have some guidelines for the practice plan again in the fall sometime to be able to share with you all. Other questions? I don't have anything more here, Jessica, is that right? Okay. Well, you know where to find us. And we're and gonna- And if you saw the big sign on the wall out here, you know where to find at least the education people. <laughs> School of Medicine <laughs> is right. now a giant sign. That's right. I saw for the first time tonight. Um, so. Lots more to come, frequent communication. Um, we would hope to have updates, um, I think. Um, you can expect a flow of information now that we have launched this process. Uh, will it be perfect? No. Uh, will there be bumps? Abs absolutely. But I, I hope you understand the commitment. I hope you understand that we are prepared to do whatever is necessary to make this work, to make this smooth, and, and to, to end up at a different place uh, with um, staff and faculty members uh, happy and productive and following uh, their careers in supporting academic medicine in the state. And I forgot mm -hmm. to do one thing, which is introduce my chief of staff who can, who's over here, Maureen Schaefer. Um, so if you need things and can't get hold of me, Maureen can do everything. So I just wanted to be sure and introduce her. And again, uh, on behalf of Barbara, I think we appreciate very much uh, the turnout and, and very much your attention to what we think are very important issues. Thank you for coming. Thank you.